Um, yeah, Ben Bolker and Doug Bates and Martin Meckler had the lion's share of made the lion's share of contributions to that package. But yeah, it is a pretty exciting package. Um, thank you, Amy. And I'm going to talk about something that I haven't yet talked about today. Um, today on uh, my work on um, data curation and in particular this thing called the International Infectious Disease Data Archive, which doesn't exist yet, pronounced IDA, um, and its work to make um, data that's supposed to be publicly available, there's no sort of anonymity concerns or anything like that, and should be available to everybody, um, um, sort of convenient and um, and available, but um, the problem is that it tends to be locked up into these um, sort of books that sit in the basements of places like StatCan that need to be scanned and typed into a computer and that kind of thing. So we're trying to make it more convenient to access um, data on um, infectious diseases um, going back in time. So this isn't so much about surveillance work, but more about um, people who want to study past epidemics and historical data, and we're trying to be systematic about it. So let me just, can you guys see my screen? You cannot see my screen. <laughs> yeah. So there we go, pardon me. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Okay. And right, there's my full page. <laughs> okay. And so, as I said, the focus is on historical infectious disease data. So not contemporary surveillance and just a bit of background on the project. So David Earn, my supervisor at McMaster has been, he's been modeling historical epidemics for a long time now. And over that time has been putting together a lot of data sets to fit his models to and to inform the work. And he sort of organizes it and organizes those data um, and previously made them available through something called IDA, which is, as I mentioned, the International Infectious Disease Data Archive. Um, it was a small little thing that David just used to, you know, disseminate his work on sort of pulling together historical data sets. But it's sort of been down for technical reasons, and that's one of the things I've been working on the last couple of years is to bring it back up. And we're sort of trying to be ambitious about how we bring it back up. Um, the current deadline is October, um, sort of have to make that one. Um, and we're, we're sort of not going to bring it up publicly until we get submitted our, our first publication because it's been so much effort. Um, and then we're going to give it all away for free. So um, when we bring it up, we're going to try to be systematic about Canadian data. So. Um, previously, I'd have just had whatever data were, were needed to support publications of the group, essentially, more or less. Still a great resource, but it wasn't very systematic. It included data from all kinds of places. And um, the last couple of years, we've been systematic. Uh, we're inspired by this thing called Project Tycho in the United States, which a few years ago um, was an effort to do the same thing, to sort of go into all of the public health offices around the country in the US and pull them all together into a nice database that you can use to do things like plot, you know, measles, measles incidents over five decades or something like that in New Mexico, something like those kinds of questions. So we want to do something similar in Canada. Um, so, yeah, the overall goal is just to make it straightforward and convenient to access these publicly available, but historical data. We're focusing on incidence, mortality, and population data. So the incidence data that we've got go between 1924 to 2000, population between 1871, all the way up to the present, and mortality data from 1950 to 2010. Um, the population data, I know they're not that exciting, but the goal is to sort of make a one-stop shop because you always need population data to normalize your incidence and mortality counts. Um, and so just gonna describe each of those three kinds of data that we have and just tell you a little bit about them and what we've done to um, make them easier to use. 
hopefully. And then at the end, if we have time, I can talk about some more challenging yet interesting things. I don't know at the end of the day, if that's what you want to hear, but there's sort of modeling and maximum likelihood and you'll hear all kinds of technical stuff um, that comes up once you have data like this. So um, the, we'll start with the, the notifiable disease incident stuff. So the data come to us like this. Well, actually they come to me like this. Someone actually had to go and photocopy them. So it's a range of handwritten documents and typewritten documents, all of which I deemed to be too hard to get a computer to read and reliably put into a spreadsheet, but things may have changed in the last two and a half years. I'm, I'm not sure. It could be a really cool project, but we, to try to do machine learning on this, but we've entered all of these manually. Um, and so could be interesting machine learning project to take our manually entered um, digitizations to train a, a model that can make it more efficient to digitize the historical record in Canada, because there's tons more data. There's so much of this stuff. There. So we're really only scratching the surface. Um, and so for the disease incident stuff, like I said, it's 1924 to 2000. Um, it's weekly up until 1980. And then after that, it's monthly, sometimes quarterly, actually. Um, everything gets worse in, 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 you know, Canadian governmental record keeping as time goes on, as far as I can tell, just because of lack of funding, pretty much. Um, it's amazing how detailed it was back in 1924 uh, when they were doing the handwritten stuff. Uh, it's broken down by province. We try to have everything broken down by province um, in the archive. Uh, it's also broken down by disease. And I'm going to open up a, sorry, I need to. Where are we? You. Exit full screen. So here's the list of diseases. It's too long of a picture to put on a slide. And so what I've got down here is on the X axis, the number of years from 1920 to 2000. And each row is a particular disease and green means that we have data on it for those year ranges and red means that they didn't know it wasn't notifiable in those years um, so i've got the best diseases at the bottom we've got a really good data for diphtheria as you can see pretty good data for rubella typhoid fever blah 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 you can read this list chicken pops pox mumps gonorrhea botulism syphilis whooping cough and as, as you can see as we go up the list things get both more specific in terms of the, you know, it's not, it's not just gonorrhea, but it's this kind of gonorrhea. And also there's less coverage in the data set. Um, some stuff, you know, like rabies didn't get recorded until later, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, so that's pretty, and you can see this is a long list. So there's all kinds of data, but really, if you're looking for the long time series, you're looking sort of in just this shorter list. Diseases. Um, go back to full screen mode. And uh, some diseases are broken down by age and sex before 1956, but I'm not going to show you much of that. They don't do that anymore. So um, our process basically starts with. Um, taking a scan like this. So here's an example of one from, I think this is 1957, 1956, excuse me. And um, looks pretty much like this. And we make um, replicas in Excel. So it's sort of, we try to make the spatial layout as close as possible, but now it's in Excel and someone just types this in. Um, and the idea to make it the spatial layout as close as possible so that you can check for errors more easily. And it's sort of an interesting archiving thing. Um, and once it's in this digital format, 
then we can write scripts to produce the kind of data that you want to do analysis. So a CSV file in long format with a controlled set of columns that you can mix and match different data sources with. Um, so lots of scripting and data entry has been done by undergrad and master's students, um, all kinds of graduate students as well. Um, and I'll show you some of those later. So here's an example of our best disease, quote unquote, diphtheria. And here's sort of what the data look like. So um, we're going to encounter our first sort of what I call data harmonization problem with this data set. But on the x-axis, you've got the mid-date of the reporting period. So for each reporting period, there's a count or right, a number of cases recorded. And on the y-axis, we've got the daily case rate. So the number of cases in that period divided by the length of the period. And on the x-axis, we've got the middle of the reporting period. And each, each dot is a reporting period. Um, and this is just Canada, not broken down by province. And the color of the dots gives you the number of days in the period. So you can see sometimes, basically more or less, what this is telling you is that sometimes we've got monthly data and sometimes we have weekly data, which is what I said earlier. And when you divide by the, the size of the reporting period, you should get monthly and weekly data lining up, although that doesn't always happen. So there's a whole bunch of data quality issues that we, we still are solving and I'm not gonna shy away from showing them to you. You can see here that the monthly data average case rate looks um, larger than the weekly. And that's because um, uh, that's because of, of, a, of a problem with how the original data set added up, um, added up the, the case numbers. And so we're digging into these and we're gonna have, and we're gonna you know, address them somehow. But the point is it's an archiving project. So we wanna give you the numbers as written down in 1927 all the way to 2000 with tools that will help you sort of address these problems. And I'll show you some of those tools later. But you know, there are fewer cases of diphtheria over time, <laughs> um, which is good. Um, okay, so that's case data, and I should actually point out that we're not dividing by the population size here, which is normally something that you want to do. And so I'll talk about the population data because it's the kind of thing we're going to do later on. Um, so we make use of six, oh, sorry, of three data sources to get population data. Um, it's strangely scattered. It's scattered around and not necessarily pulled together. If somebody tells me that they've already done what we've done, I will be pretty sad because it was actually a big job to get a comprehensive data set for Canadian populations broken down by province and sex and age. Um, so we, pardon me, so we use the, um, the sixth census of Canada that goes from 1881 to 1921. Then we use something called the revised annual estimates of population which is a stat can report that gives us information from 1921 to 71. And then we get one that is just an online data portal after 1971, they give you all of the data. You can just go get them online. So we connect all these things together. Um, the census looks kind of like this. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages, but on page six of volume two, you can see tables that look like this. This is just for two years here, 1881 and 1891. You can see it's broken down by age and sex, and all of these things need to get entered. Um, this is the report in uh, between 1921 and 1971, an amazing sort of opus on demography, trying to get the best possible estimates of Canadian populations every year. Um, and it looks like this, and there is just tons of information to enter, and we entered all of this. And this, as far as I could tell, was not entered anywhere. So um, hopefully that will help people. And then you can just go to the portal to get the last source of data. So when you line them all up, this is just total Canadian population. You can see that the three data sources are colored differently, and they line up. So they're sort of consistent, and we figured out how to do that. Um, by having to do a whole bunch of data cleaning. Um, as far as I can tell, this is the, the most comprehensive one-stop shop for Canadian population data. 
Um, but I hope I'm probably wrong, but I couldn't find anything. Um, I thought since this is in Newfoundland, it would be interesting to look at the Newfoundland population. So you can see Newfoundland population doesn't go back as far in time because 1950 was when it became a province. Apparently there's information for 1949. I don't know why. And um, you can see, or at least it looks to me like there's an effect of the COD moratorium in the 90s. Uh, with the declining populations, you can see all kinds of interesting things like this. You can see the effect of the gold rush in the Yukon um, for a while there. Once the gold rush subsided, which was quickly, people were leaving quickly. You can also see some data quality issues with how the demographers dealt with sparse data. It looks to me like they really didn't have yearly data on Yukon populations. They were pretty much just repeating them, I think, for that annual report that they put out in the 70s. Um, and this also was kind of interesting to me, which is this is the portion of, of the population which were female in the Yukon, and it, I guess a lot of men went out there initially for the gold rush, and then slowly over time it got back to something more 50-50. So you can look at all the interesting things like this. I'm, I was surprised why the, this gap here in, in the Northwest Territories, that big drop, corresponds to none of it being becoming a province of a territory, but I didn't I couldn't figure out why the none of it act came later. I don't know why these things don't match up. There's all kinds of just tons of stuff, tons of like head scratchers when you look at all of these data. And it gets worse with the incident stuff. Okay, so mortality. Um these go from 1950 to 2020. Um and they're also weekly and consistently weekly the whole way through, which is interesting. Um, they are broken down by province as well. Like I said, we do that all for everything. And broken down by selected cause groups. I'll describe what that means in a moment. And we got this one not by entering data, by typing into a spreadsheet, but we actually contacted StatCan and asked them to extend their current data portal um, on Canadian mortality broken down by province and selected causes, which currently goes back just um, to uh, 2010. And we asked them to take it essentially back to 1950. So you can click on this link and get just right now data going back to 2010, but we're going to release further back. And we paid the money and it took a lot of work to figure out how to do that because we had to work with them because um, the sort of the definitions of diseases change over time. So it was actually a big job for StatCan to figure out how to line up the different ICD codes or disease codes so that we could make a comparable data set going that far back. Um, and also they gave us data rounded to um, multiples of five, but randomly. So we don't know if we should, if we round it up or round it down. And that's apparently to protect anonymity, even though it's very, seems very unlikely that if you had low um, numbers of people who died of a particular cause in 1950, that that would cause any sort of privacy concern, genuine privacy concern, but StatCan has very strict guidelines. And so we have to deal with rounded data. And also it might be interesting just for people to know that you can ask StatCan to do stuff like this, for you to go into their the records that they have that are technically publicly available, but that they haven't had the time to make publicly available to put onto the website. And you can pay them to give them to you as long as there are no privacy concerns. Um, so that's an interesting thing that can be done. Um, and these are the list of causes. So we have um, uh, total causes is just all cause, which I'll show you later. And these are cause groups. So these are the these are the the this is the list of causes that StatCan when we started the project that StatCan thought the population of that the Canadian public should know about or might be interested in. Right, they're the things that are on their data portal back to 2010. And so um, this was what we we dealt with. We just said we want to take the data portal that you have now, but just make it go further back in time, because it was such a hard job even to do that. Um, uh, that we we couldn't do any better than breaking it down further. Importantly, though, for at least our research group, we've got influenza and pneumonia, which could be interesting for um, 
infectious disease researchers, researchers but there's all kinds of other causes. Um, these, this is what the all cause divided by population looks like um, in Canada spanning 70 years. And, you know, it's going down, which is good, which is good for a while. And it looks like it's starting to go up again, which is a little bit alarming. Um, but that's a long data set. You can see the cycles there. Um, this is influenza and pneumonia over the same time period. You can also see the cycles. You can see these breakpoints, which I believe, we believe, are due to some different ICD code problems. I don't think that that, that this apparent shift in the, in the mean uh, influenza and pneumonia mortality is real at 2000. Um, but you can certainly see some big outbreaks that happen throughout history, which I do think are real. Um, we can drill down to say Ontario, and then you can start to see this effect of the cell count rounding to protect people's anonymity. It starts to get sort of rougher there, less smooth. That's because of the rounding. And if you go down to Newfoundland, where you don't get very much influenza and pneumonia, the counts aren't very high. You really do have sometimes a handful of people in Newfoundland with a case in any particular week, um, then you get, you start to get a time series that looks much less exciting. But, you know, it could be interesting to try to smooth that out and reconstruct something smoother. Um, this is influenza and pneumonia in Canada, um, zoomed in to say 1956, which was a bad year. And so you can start to see flu seasons and things like that. So you can see cycles and peaks and start fitting models to these things. It's a very interesting data set. Okay, so now that's basically an overview of the data we have. And now I'm gonna talk about some sort of more technical stuff and sort of, there's a whole bunch of details that goes into making these data sets um, sort of convenient to use. And a lot of it is very technical and challenging and interesting and can't cover all of it. So I'm gonna cover a few of the more, of the stuff that I find interesting basically. So this is what I call harmonization and modeling. So like what I mean by harmonization is, um, um, you know, the, disease codes change over time. So how can you harmonize all that information from different data sources to create a, a single time series for a particular place? Um, or how do you deal with, with all kinds of changes in how the data were recorded over time? That's harmonization. So you can stitch all the sources together to make time series. And then modeling is, well, that's modeling. So um, you know, like I said, data come from multiple sources. There's a bunch of idiosyncrasies, which I just talked about. Um, so disease and place names change over time. Disease codes change over time. Um, the data are hierarchical, but not throughout the whole history of the archive. Um, so, you know, we've got diseases within families of diseases. Um, there are inconsistent time periods. So when we talked about earlier when weekly data shift to monthly or even quarterly, what do you do with them? And when do those, how do you deal with them overlapping, right? These aren't just straight up time series. And um, age groupings and definition, age group definitions change over time. I haven't talked about age groups, but we have those two. And um, over time they changed, you know, whether or not it was going to be um, 10 year age groups or five year age groups. Um, and how they broke things up, and so I have to deal with those as well. Um, and then, obviously, um, sometimes the data themselves are not what we want. Sometimes what we want are to be able to make inferences and extract latent variables, things like the force of infection or transmission rate and that kind of thing. So how can we get from these data the quantities that we're actually interested in? Um, so I'm going to talk about that stuff now. So. I do apologize for this not being a Canadian example, but we have a very interesting, interesting work that could be applied to Canadian data done by master's student um, Kevin Zhao and David Earn on scarlet fever in the United Kingdom. And these are scarlet fever mortality data. 
and the same kinds of problems we have with the Canadian data with incidence and mortality, but this just happens to be Scarlet Haven. Um, so it's an interesting data set going from 1840 um, all the way to 1930. And Kevin did an SIR model. This is his, I'm not gonna go into detail because I know it's the end of the day here, but this is a difference equation model uh, of an SIR model. It's a pretty standard SIR model. Um, I'll walk through a few things to point them out to you. So B and D are the observed birth and death counts for all mortality causes. The death counts are for all mortality. So not just scarlet fever. And this we can get from the data as well. Um, and it's the total population. CFP is the case fatality proportion. So that's just the proportion of infectious the people who are infectious with scarlet fever who die due to scarlet fever. Um, and that is assumed based on data to be 0 0.05. And then this delta M thing is what we get out of our model to compare with our data. So these are just the weekly counts of the weekly mortality. So it's what we're gonna fit using maximum likelihood. And um, beta T is a time varying transmission rate. So part of me, uh, I should explain something else first. So you can see this capital Lambda T, that's what I call the force of, what people I think call the force of infection. It's the per capita um, proportion of susceptibles um, that become infectious in, in a time step. And it's the rate at which susceptibles become infectious. And it equals, this is a pretty standard formulation, I think this is just called mass action. It's the transmission rate beta times the number of infectious individuals divided by the population size. And the idea is that beta T is time varying. We don't use, this is sort of can be a challenge. People don't expect that the transmission rate is constant over time because behavior changes. And so people contact each other at different rates, et cetera. So this is an inference problem. How can we estimate how the course of infection changes over time and how the transmission rate varies over time? Um, and right, it varies over time. So if we want to infer it, infer the force of infection. Um, we might think we need to come up with the functional form of these changes over time, but we often don't know them. I mean, it, sometimes we do, and it's great, like school closures and stuff like that, but even then we don't really know them. Um, it would be nice to be able to estimate them from data, and that's the approach that I'm gonna demonstrate, that Kevin and David demonstrate here, um, using data and a flexible model. Um, the way we're gonna do things, hopefully this isn't gonna to get too technical, is we're gonna use um, radial basis functions to represent um, the time variation in the transmission rate. I'm gonna do a little bit of a, just an aside here and go to this figure, which did not fit very nicely on in the slide. So I apologize for the, this is a little, it'll be a little bit rough, but this will, informally, I think, it, should get the point across. You can imagine that this is say the log of, on the wax is say the log of transmission rate and it's varying over time. And the idea is it's a pretty sort of complex functional form and we wanna be able to fit it in a flexible way so that, you know, although in this case it went down right here, maybe you have that drop happens earlier or something like that. And to explain how this is done, we can explain um, how this um, function is put together. It's put together with something called radial basis functions. So that's what these things are here. So the idea is you draw a bunch of Gaussians evenly spaced um, along, that are centered at different points in time. And each of these Gaussians is associated with a weight. So for example, um, the first Gaussian has 
reasonably low weight, whereas the fourth Gaussian has this very high positive weight. And what you do to get the, the value of the function at any point in time is to take each weight, multiply it by the Gaussian, and add up all, the value of the Gaussians times the weights um, at each point in time, and that generates this curve. So if that didn't make sense, this should make sense, which is you can see that the weights here determine how high the curve is going to be at any point in time, except that it's being smooth. So it takes something that's discrete and makes it smooth. So for example, you can see where the weights are high, you can see we get peaks in the curve. Um, and where the weight is low, you get sort of these troughs in the curve. So it takes this sort of discrete number of points that we can estimate, right? This is a number of coefficients that we could potentially estimate using data and turns it into the smooth um, function that we might use to represent the transmission rate. And that's the idea. It's okay if that didn't make sense. Basically, the idea is we're going to estimate transmission rate <laughs> using a flexible method. Um, so like I said, we're going to estimate them these coefficients of the radial basis functions by maximum likelihood. And this is the fit to the scarlet fever data that I showed earlier. The red is the observed and the black is the fit, so the fit is reasonably good. Um, this is using this software called MacPan2, which is my other area of my other sort of research project is software for fitting compartmental models to data. And once you have this model fitted, you can pull out the time series, the estimated time series, of, in this case, force of infection, we could have plotted a transmission rate, or you could even transform it into um, RT, the reproductive number changing over time, that kind of thing. And you can see this is an, so, so, so mathematical epidemiologists like David and Kevin are interested in this because now they've got um, an estimate of how the force of infection changes over time, and they're going to use that in their mathematical analysis to better understand um, the history of scarlet fever in London. Um, so that's an example of the kind of thing you can do to take the take the data in the archive um, and um, estimate epidemiological quantities of interest. Now, there's another sort of related but d distinct problem, which is with, with the archive, which is um, counts over unequal time periods. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes the data change from being met, being reported over weeks to months and the weeks and the month data overlap and we also get annual data and all kinds of other stuff. It gets very complex. Um, so there's these idiosyncrasies in how the data are recorded. Um, you know, counts reported over different lengths of time, like I said, the periods overlap and there's gaps in the counts. This is okay with custom mechanistic models like I just showed um, because you can just make sure that you compare your model output with the, with the data as you have them. Um, but it's not so great if you wanna use say traditional time series analysis methods. Um, and that's a big drawback because people do wanna just see, okay, you know, like every week, what's the best estimate of say mortality or incidence of this particular disease over time just to get a high level view and to be able to use traditional time series methods. So here's a cartoon explaining the problem yet again. So on the um, x-axis, we have the midpoint of the time interval over which the count was recorded. In this case, cases, which are on the y-axis. So each point is a record. So the, um, the data point that we have for January 15th in this data set yielded 300 cases of a particular disease. Size and color of the point tells you how long the time period is. And so it, basically what this is showing is we've got monthly and weekly data. And so, yes, there was more, we got higher counts when we recorded them for longer periods of time, or when some recorded them for longer periods of time. This is work done by Mike Roswell, by the way, as a postdoc. Um, you can write this in a better way, though, to show that actually the 
average daily case rate, which corrects for the number for the size of the reporting period, is basically probably going up over this period. Right. And so even though we got more cases, the period was long enough that we actually estimate that cases were coming in at a slower rate earlier in the year than later in the year. That's the cartoon. Um, and then the idea is, can we, pardon me, can we fit a model to these kinds of data that will allow us to reconstruct our best estimate of the average number of, of the daily case number of cases or weekly number of cases or whatever time scale you want per 100,000 residents or divided by whatever you can normalize however you like. So what Michael did is he used something called generalized additive models um, in R. So using the MGCB package, and this was his model formula that he used. And um, he used it to be able to fit to the sort of the messy data we have to be able to interpolate the number of daily cases per 100,000 residents. So he, 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 the way the model worked was he fit the count, the number of cases, um, as a smooth function of the time point. So that's what this means, smooth. It's one of those complex functions like the one I showed earlier based on basis functions. And K is a smoothing parameter, which we'll talk about in a second. And then you can, these next two lines, they can, can they control for reporting length and um, population size using this technique called offsets. Um, it's basically the, the model equivalent of dividing <laughs> by things to normalize. And we used for anyone who cares negative binomial error structure, and then fit these to a bunch of data. And we, there was a big issue, which is choosing an appropriate K, which I'll describe now. So here's a complex graph that I apologize that came from Michael's excellent poster. And on the, but I'll try to talk through it. So on the y axis, we've got daily salmonella infections um, per 100,000. And the four, and on the on the x-axis we've got time. The dots in every case, the blue dots are um, actual data from our archive. You can see the top row is a zoom in of the full time series going much further, spanning quite a few decades. Um, the reason we zoomed in is because the full picture is messy, and that's largely due to the challenges with disease names changing all the time but it still sort of is interesting to someone studying salmonella, but maybe less interesting to the conversation today. Um, and so I'll direct your attention up here where the data are considered, we can understand them more quickly. Um, and you can see that when you make your smoothing parameter too high, where the number of points divided by the smoothing parameter is, sorry, too low <laughs> is, is 100, you get this reconstructed daily case rate, which is the red line, sort of not capturing, at least to my eye, these cycles. Um, whereas if you choose a better smoothing parameter, you get, in my view, a better estimate of the cycles. And not, and you don't have to worry, the important thing here is you don't have to worry about overlapping time periods and you know, gaps and um, you know, whether they were monthly for a little bit and then turned back to weekly, you just get the best estimate out of the model and these can be associated with confidence intervals and all the rest of it. Now you can go throw this red line into different time series analysis like waves, late wavelet analysis or spectral analysis, that kind of thing. Or just to get a picture of the trends. Um, there's a bunch of other harmonization challenges that I didn't talk about um, associated with, with changing definitions and names and hierarchies. <laughs> um, so, you know, infectious, you, you have a disease is nested within a disease family. And sometimes when they, when they were keeping really good records, they told you about that full hierarchy, whereas other times, you know, they told you about different kinds of botulism, say, and then other times, mostly later on, they said, oh, that's just botulism. And then you have to be able to reconcile all that in data. Um, that's a big job, but it's maybe less interesting than all that modeling stuff. 
Um, age structure data presents some interesting challenges where the age group definitions change over time. I hinted at that a little bit before. These data also come sort of hierarchically. They have hierarchical bidding strategies. And what we've done is use these monotonic splines for interpolating cumulative age distributions. So it's just sort of the way to um, interpolate an age dis uh, a, a probability distribution, like a histogram. It's a way to interpolate a histogram that's principled. Um, and also, um, we're connecting data to our historical data to recent data. During COVID, we didn't have very much luck with this because people were at the different agencies around the country were too swamped to help us get the recent data, too swamped with COVID, but we're just starting to come out of that. And in fact, Ontario just came through with a really great data set that we're eager to connect that goes right up to the present um, that we're eager to connect with our um, incidence data. Um, so I am, okay, I guess there's 15 minutes left. Maybe I will push through and give you a small little demo on some technology that we're building that isn't available yet to help you sort through this stuff. And this will be a live demo that hopefully doesn't screw up in front of you because that's what happens with live demos. And I've been having with GitHub trouble with GitHub today, but, um, there's basically, we've got these sort of three ways that we're building to make it a little bit easier to access the data. We've got all of our data prep pipelines that I talked about on GitHub. So you can go and reproduce our analyses and get the data there. Um, we've got a shiny app to make that easier. We've got some R code that lets you do it easier, hopefully, and then proper API so that people can build applications on top of it. If the heavens open up and this all becomes extremely successful. Um, so I'm going to click on the uh, sort of the GitHub repository so you can look something like this and you can go and look at our pipeline so you can see all of these different data sources. These are associated with the data sets that I talked about today. This is, I don't know, the Canadian incidence data between 1956 and 1961. So um, I can click on that and I can see all of the digitizations. These are all the Excel files associated with the project. All of the prep scripts, these are the R scripts that people wrote to transform the Excel files into the tidy data sets. The scans themselves so that you can compare with what we digitized and find errors. And then some metadata associated with them. So if you, this morning it wasn't working. If I clicked on this GitHub set, I don't want to show you this PDF file. Oh, it did right now. Great. And so you can conveniently get the uh, scans associated with each of these data sets. Um, you can also get the, um, so you can download the Excel files. I'm not going to do that now. And you can look at these prep scripts. So they're all sitting there as well for the different year ranges. So for example, they all kind of look like this and have a similar series of steps that you can go in and say, if you disagree with how we processed, you know, such and such, because data set, because you read the footnotes and we got it wrong and you thought we got it wrong. Because when you looked at your scatter plot, it looked horribly wrong. Well, it's all open and you can go see how we did it and reproduce it. Um, and if we go over here, we also have, um, a, a shiny app, which might work, which might work out. So it looks like this, so you can go and search through data in the archive. So for example, let's say I want to choose data from Ontario and I want to look at measles or something like that. And I click apply and I can get this preview of the data um, that are available. And it, if the data come from this, these all come from this particular data source with this data set ID that you can line up with those pipelines. But if you've got data from different data sources, they'll put them all together. Um, you can download the data as well as the metadata and the source files again, if you want those 
PDFs and Excel files and R scripts and things like that. You can also, it also generates code automatically for you to paste the results of this query into your R script. So if I click on this and I go over here to this to R and I type it into here and I, and I just run that in R, it's going to return the same data set that I just got and I can look at it in R so we can embed these things in, in scripts and it'll pull from an API. Now, right now it's just pulling locally from my computer. I've got the API running locally on my laptop, but the idea is that it'll be in a few months, it'll be live. And so this will be on the internet. Um, and this is all sort of based on a proper API, which I'm not going to bother showing you. Um, so I think it's probably too much detail in the end of the day, and I'm going to skip to just acknowledging all of these, this very, the very large number of people, a lot of people who entered data um, that they're labeled with the word digitization. Um, HandMod um, provided funding. This is this big emerging infectious disease research network that I think also provided funding for this workshop. David Earn, who's been working on this stuff for a long time and um, on you know, making historical data available for a long time. Um, Jonathan Dushoff and Ben Bolker, who have helped. Um, there have been a lot of sort of graduate students who have done programming and modeling and R development. So Jen Freeman, Mike Roswell, Kevin Zhao, um, um, Biko Sigu, and these are some really smart undergrad students who wrote the API and the Shiny app, <laughs> computer science students, um, and a bunch of other people who helped as well. It's been a big project because there's lots to do and pull together. And that's all that I have for you today. Thank you. Uh, happy to any questions or if people are tired out, I understand. Oh, well. everybody clapped, but it was muted. And I don't even know. <laughs> so we clapped twice, but I think maybe you only heard like 10% of the clapping. So just imagine that scale. But <laughs> sounds very exciting. I heard zero clapping, but it, I, oh, it well. sounds exciting. <laughs> Oh, what am I doing? Okay. Um, does anyone have questions for Steve at all? I just turn around to. I have, um, does I, oh, Joseph has a question. There we go. Sure. <laughs> I couldn't hear that at all. Could you pair of you... cancer? Like, is that not part of it? Cause it's not an infectious disease or like, is cancer uh, included in the data? It is. That's embarrassing. I can't, I cannot remember. Uh, let me go back and get the list up there. So I don't make any mistakes. So it is not. And yeah, it is. It is confusing. Um, so it would be under all other causes. And like, so I, I mentioned it, this is definitely not ideal, but um, we went with the, the categorization of causes that StatCan publishes in their online portal for um, years going back to 2010, because it was such a big effort even to do that, to extend these cause groups back to 1950, because they were set up to query their database for these families of causes. And it's a surprisingly complex endeavor that we stuck with them. Um, and it is it is perhaps surprising, yeah, that, that cancer is not there. Thank I don't you, think yeah, so. Steve, I think Sophie, are you Sophie? No. Okay. Um, 
Cancer's right here, malignant neoplasms. <laughs> That's why the, the, the audience was oh, saying. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, it was, I was surprised. I thought that seems weird, but I must have been. Yeah, okay. like, uh, we got some really good listeners. And <laughs> sorry, sorry, that was so, that was yeah. me. No, like I uh, check. Okay. Uh, were there any other questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, just no. Just if he doesn't have a question. Um, a uh, minor question. I was curious if there's any thought on how much underreporting there is um, population data and if it's changing over time. Yeah, good question. Did you hear, Steve? No, I didn't. Under underreporting and how it's changed over time. That is a great question. Now, I haven't. I've done virtually nothing on it. All that I can say is the following. If you recall, there were these three, um, this is going to seem pretty meager, but it is what was done. There are these three data sources. And this middle data source, this 1971 and revised annual estimates report was, uh, is associated with extensive information on methodology de designed to take all kinds of information into account to get the best possible estimate of the population in any particular year. Now, I certainly haven't gone through and assessed what I think about it, nor would I really be qualified. I mean, I'm not a demographer. Um, but I was gratified at least that these other two data sources, I can line up by just doing, by, by just making sure that, that the data all um, you know, are, are harmonized that I, that I've got the, you know, that, that I've squashed any errors in, in our pipeline. And once I do that, then you see, there's, there's actually a red point that's overlapping this green point that they do tend to align. Now it doesn't necessarily mean very much, but, but that's really all that I've done. I don't, I don't, and I also maybe don't know if I've completely addressed your <coughs> concern. Um, I, I have a, like a comment. Um, you're probably never going to give a presentation where you choose Newfoundland as an example population again, but um, Newfoundland wasn't part of Canada until 1949. And uh, I think it's sort of interesting in this figure, like you can like see a little bit what happens when you add in the, the Newfoundland data, but um, Newfoundland was part of England prior to 1949 and actually like the last province to join the confederation and it's super weird for me right because memorial university was founded in 1929 like and <laughs> wasn't part like i work for a university it, it wasn't always part of canada so yeah but you can see it a little bit in your population data like i thought like maybe newfoundland is like so small that like you wouldn't even notice in your green line when you did all of Canada, but you can see that a teeny weeny. Yeah. It's actually visually detectable. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else uh, have any questions? All right. That was fantastic, Steve. Let's uh, thank Steve again for his presentation. Thanks everybody. Thank you for listening. And I'll yeah, hope to have reports out through the various channels about this being all publicly available very soon. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know what next. Uh, right. Bye -bye. Stop the recording. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs>